So we uh, constantly move between hardware and software at MIT, and uh, a lot of the startups do both. Um, but what we always try to do is uh, the products uh, want to amaze. And one of those places that tries to amaze the most is the Media Lab. Uh, the next speaker, Brad Knox, is the CEO of eMotors. And he comes out of uh, Cynthia Brazil's lab. Uh, and he was a postdoc there uh, in, in robotics and social robotics. And uh, I think he has a PhD from uh, U Texas, um, and he's building his startup uh, out of there. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Thank you, Tron. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brad Knox, founder and CEO of a Motors based in Austin, Texas. And I'll jump right into what we're doing. So, uh oh. The, the next button on here seems to be mapping to escape. Let's try the other one. All right. So we are making tiny, intelligent, and charming little robots for your desktop, tabletop, or bedside table. Uh, these little robots. Uh, they love to interact with their owners through things that you say, sounds that you make, through touch. And you can inexpensively get more than one, and they'll play games with each other, interact with each other. And then you can also interact with them not only directly, but through their environment as well. Uh, so a very new form of, of interaction. Um, and before I get into how we're making it, I'm going to backtrack a little bit to the origin. So here I am in the Media Lab. And when I was there, the grad students and the postdocs, some of us would get together and gripe because we were all there because to, for, we had different but similar visions of wanting to build robots that we personally wanted to interact with. And not only had we not achieved that, nobody had. None of us had robots that, in, that we wanted to interact with on a daily basis. And so we were asking this question, where are our robot companions? And I actually took a step back and asked a somewhat simpler question, which we still didn't have an answer for, which is where are robot creatures? And there have been some, some really marvelous uh, attempts at products for lifelike robot creatures, but really there hasn't been a successful product that at a mainstream level delivers this illusion of life that fascinates, entertains, and delights us. I, I took some time to think about why and came up with this list of some common limitations of these previous efforts. So uh, for one, their form often sets high expectations. So if the robot looks humanoid or dog-like, you expect it to be as smart and intelligent and act like a dog or like a human. And we can't deliver that yet. Uh, another thing is they often are high cost. They require manual recharging. Or if they have a charging base they can find, they can only find it some percentage of the, of the time, like, like a Roomba if you, if you have one. Uh, also, usage data is not, col not collected with most of these products by the companies. They often have slow movement or repetitive behavior, uh, which means that they often end up uh, seeming less organic than they, they could and also getting old uh, more quickly than they should. And then lastly, partially because of the, the recharging issue, they only interact with their users. They don't actually have a life of their own. When you leave, they're just inactive. And that really hurts the illusion of life, too. So that's robotic creatures. But interestingly, virtual creatures have had a lot of success. So I'm guessing many of you are familiar with Tamagotchi, definitely a big hit. But since then, there have been a lot of other successes. So for instance, uh, Nintendogs here, the second one, it's the second best-selling video game series for the Nintendo DS, which is the second best-selling video game console of all time. Uh, some other successes here. And now uh, virtual pets and virtual creatures are represented mostly in apps, uh, where one estimate had that 5% of the top 300 grossing iOS games were virtual pet games. So this is a continued success here. Now, on the other hand, there have been a number of studies by human-robot interaction researchers showing that when you compare a physical and a virtual character, where the only difference is the physicality, the physical ones result in more enjoyment, and they're treated more like a social partner. So putting these two things together, we've got that virtual creatures have been successful. Physical embodiment really makes people see it more as a social entity and more, more lifelike and enjoy it more. 
And there's a big opportunity there. So the question then becomes, how can we realize this opportunity where previous efforts have failed? So at Ed Motors, we are following a set of design criteria that, uh, that you'll see harken back to that list of common limitations. So first we want highly organic behavior, and I'll talk about how we do that through machine learning. We also want the robots to be, quote, always on, except when they're, they're sleeping, uh, basically recharging. So they should never be just off. They should never have a, a depleted battery. Uh, I'll talk briefly about that. They should also have their own life. If you go on vacation, they should still be active, interacting with each other, their environments, and so on. And they should set fulfillable expectations by their morphology and their behavior, Expect expectations that they can uh, possibly even exceed. And then lastly, they should be affordable. So for, to make this highly organic behavior, we're using the research that I did with Cynthia Brazil at MIT, uh, where we had a human puppeteer a robot while it interacted with, with a, a person, and, and the person didn't know that it was being puppeteered. From that puppeteering, we would gather data and apply machine learning, so we'd end up with a model of the puppeteer. And this model, importantly, captures the, the flow, the spontaneity, the play of the puppeteer in a way that, that really isn't going to happen if you do the more traditional way of defining a character where you sit back and, and make rules or imagine what the character should do in certain situations. And we found, that, uh, we found really positive results in terms of how uh, the, the subjects in our studies responded to this and how organic it just subjectively seemed to us. We also wanted these robots to be low cost but have high intelligence and interactivity. And we achieved that through the Internet of Things platform, where uh, this platform serves as the eyes, the ears, and the brains for these robots, wirelessly controlling them. And what that actually translates to uh, is there's an overhead camera, a microphone, and a computer in this platform uh, doing the perception and the decision making for these robots. And what that achieves is, is a number of things, but, but two important ones. One, because we know exactly where the robot is from the camera and exactly where the charging station is, we can get it back to the charging station with super high reliability so that the, the actual user effort to keep this a persistent and a live part of your environment is very little. Also, it allows the individual robots to be inexpensive, diverse, and collectible. We're working with uh, our partners Push Start Creative to actually finalize the designs on these. And here are a couple of uh, the designs that we're currently exploring. So these aren't final designs, uh, but they're ones that, that I'm particularly excited about. Compared to what else is out there, uh, Motors robots really maximize illusion of life uh, and uh, long-term, and we're aiming to, to design it to, to support long-term usage. So really trying to combat the issue with a lot of existing electronic characters where they get old uh, fairly quickly once you, you get a feel for what they do. We also, uh, another differ differentiating factor is that they're fully Internet of Things, uh, always Internet connected, uh, affordable, and they're fairly unique in that, they, that we're designing them to appeal to a wider audience than just children or the elderly in nursing homes. We have a wonderful team, uh, including Dr. Eric Zavesky, who has a PhD in computer, uh, computer vision from Columbia. Uh, there, there's me. We also have Heather Campa, jo uh, Jonathan Giorgino. Uh, Jonathan was actually the only electrical engineer for Wonder Workshop, which some of you guys might know as the, uh, the toy manufacturers and designers of Dash and Dot. Uh, which are these, these kid-oriented robots that have been fairly successful. Uh, and then we have a, a wonderful collection of, of advisors and partners. So I, I talked about uh, companions at first and then backtrack to creatures. And uh, this, this initial product, our, our goal is to maximize illusion of life, and we're calling them creatures. And I think that's going to put us fairly squarely in the toy domain. But really, we want to move beyond that. I, you know, entertainment, delight, fascination, those are important values to, to give to people. Uh, but we really want to move towards companionship. And when we do that, while I don't necessarily want to call these pets, uh, they're going to be very similar in that they'll be non-human, non-verbal companions. And so if you look at the pet market, it's much larger, three times as big in the US than the, the toy market. And there are all sorts of people who can't have pets but would like to have pets. And in a recent survey, uh, the 10 of the top 11 reasons people gave for why they couldn't have a pet, those were addressable reasons by robots. So 
if you're a skeptical person like I am, you're probably wondering, can people actually bond to digital creatures? Is this, you know, is this like kind of a romantic notion? Is it just, you know, overly inspired by sci-fi? And surprisingly, the answer is already that some people do. So, uh, Sony Ibo. Uh, and uh, last year, Sony stopped repairing the Ibos. And the New York Times and many other uh, venues covered these funerals in Japan of people. And in the video, they talk about their family dog. And, and this, is, you know, this is a real formal funeral. And these people are serious when you look at them. And, and there's nothing noticeably abnormal about them either. Um, and if you backtrack to when these were released, these robots have been running for 10 to 16 years. And while, while this didn't happen in every household, these are, these are people who really are taken by, by these Sony IBOs. Um, also, there's this documentary from a little while back, maybe 2008, I think, uh, where it covers Pero, the $6,000 robot seal for nursing homes. And this elderly German woman, she lights up whenever Pero is around. It's, it's just night and day. And it's just a really uh, impressive case study of, of what can be done. Uh, with a robot and for, you know, for the right person and, and the appropriate design. I'll skip this last one for time. Um, and I'll end with a, a video of some of our user testing. So this is teleoperated uh, robots, but they don't know. And this just shows the first movement uh, and how people respond to it. So one thing that, that I find particularly compelling about these, these videos is that from the still robot, uh, let me actually say really quickly. Yeah, this guy's great. Uh, the, the way they look right now, that's all engineers doing the design, uh, which I'm proud of it being not too ugly. Uh, and I'll, I'm really looking forward to when we have the professional designers get in. Um, and I want to point out, so she's about to apologize to it. And I think that's just a, a really amazing illustration of this is a machine. She knows it's a machine. But in the same way when you watch a cartoon, you can feel that it's real. And she had this spontaneous urge to apologize to a tiny little robot running around in front of her. Uh, so I'll, I'll end with that. And uh, I would, I'd love to talk to anyone who has questions or is interested in uh, talking about a possible partnership. And thank you very much for listening.